I want to give you guys a talk and some kind of experience about what civil engineering is and maybe a little bit of general information about what engineering is and why it could be a good choice for you if this is something that you're interested in. So um, I'll try not to talk at too long of length at each time. So we'll kind of do a little bit of a presentation and we'll talk about engineering. I'll show you some videos and then we're going to do some hands-on stuff and then we'll do some more talking. So I'll try and break it up a little bit. So you're not listening to me talk for an entire hour or so. Um, so yeah, let's just hop right into it. So first off, what is engineering? Does anybody know what that term engineering is? So like if I say that I'm an engineer, what does that mean? What do I do? Well, I told you what I do, but uh, what would an engineer actually do? Yes. Analyze how something works. Analyze how something works. Yeah, so that is a really good, that's exactly what engineers do. What else? Construct designs and mock-ups of buildings and bridges. Yeah, so those are definitely some things that we do as engineers. And I love that you use buildings and bridges because uh, civil engineers work specifically in buildings and bridges. So that's kind of my domain. But there are a lot of types of engineers. Yeah, what else? They also ensure the stability and safety of things. Oh, ensure stability and safety of things. That is really important. So let's just talk about you know, the types of things engineers design. So I'm gonna ask you guys to look around the room just really quickly and see if you can identify anything in this room that was not either constructed, designed, or manufactured by some sort of engineer somewhere in the process, okay? So let's take a look, see if you guys can find anything in here that maybe engineers did not have a part in. If you have something, feel free to raise your hand or shout it out. What do you think? People from a certain point of view, okay, so, but you do have to account for the fact that like, um, you were born in a hospital, right? I'm guessing, probably, most of you were born in a hospital, so some engineer had to design that hospital, and uh, we had to have all of the correct equipment in that hospital in order to uh, make sure that you were born safely. So, but yeah, people is probably one of the closest things that we could get to, like us ourselves, when we're not necessarily engineered yet. Uh, any other things you guys could think of? Yes? The poster, so, oh, you mean like the Wolfpack poster? So that paper was actually made in a manufacturing process, right? So the paper was made in some sort of plant. That manufacturing process was probably designed by a mechanical engineer. It was rolled up into a spool, and then it was put into a printer that was most likely designed by an engineer, and it was printed out and, uh, you know, and put on the wall here. So it's a little bit of a trick question because the answer is supposed to be that there's really nothing that you can find that you use in your everyday lives that wasn't somehow impacted by an engineer at some stage. All right, so let's talk about what is engineering. So I did hear you guys say design things, right? So you said something about design. So one of the things we do as engineers is we design stuff. Um, so we actually come up with plans of how this is gonna fit together, or you know, we come up with plans with how big this is gonna be. You know, somebody had to design this table that you're sitting at and how, you know, how the legs are gonna fold out and stuff. Um, so we design things. Another thing that we do is we build things. Um, and the last one I like to always bring up is we solve problems. So really, the big difference between somebody who is a scientist and an engineer is that scientists really go out and they investigate the problems, they identify the problems, they say, you know, Lake Tahoe is 40 feet down. You know, they say that there's all this bacteria in the water and it needs to be cleaned. And scientists are very important. They help us identify our problems. But the engineers help solve the problems. We get that data from the scientists and we say, okay, how can we make this better? So I can, you know, come up with a way to keep the water better in Lake Tahoe, or I can come up with a way to clean the water that's going to go into your tap system. So um, that's what we do is we actually, in a broad sense, we're, we're solving problems. Okay. Um, and then we help people and save lives. So I liked the, the safety aspect there. So that we definitely help people and we save lives. I was like this little cartoon. So it's a... Uh, you know, and it says, now that can't be right, and they're trying to fling, you know, they're trying to actually catapult something at this uh, castle, and instead something went terribly wrong. So the engineering on this one really didn't go so well for them. Um, but I just always thought that this one was kind of cute, so I figured I'd throw this up there. But um, now there's a lot of different engineering fields, and actually, if I was thinking, I would have asked you to name some of these before I threw this slide up here. But there are so many different types of engineers and different types of fields that you could go into as an engineer. <clears throat> So you've got your biological engineering people that actually like go through and they help um, design biological systems or you know you can do sort of stuff in chemistry labs. You've got bio biomedical engineering which is similar to that. Um, chemical engineering people that go through in uh, you know pharmaceuticals. 
you don't just like have some random person like pouring stuff into beakers and coming up with you know pharmaceuticals and things, right? So you actually have an engineer that has to figure out how that stuff works. Um, you've got your civil engineering, which is of course what I'm going to talk to you about today because that is my specialty. Um, you've got computer engineering, so anything that comes on your iPhone um, that was actually written and made by an engineer. All those apps, uh, for the most part, a lot of them are computer engineers. Got electrical engineers, people that you know. Somebody had to design how these lights were going to turn on when we turned the switch on today, and they were pretty good at that. So that's what our electrical engineers do. Mechanical engineers do things like, um, uh, well, the thing that people most likely like to um, associate with mechanical engineers is roller coasters, right? So everybody wants to go into roller coaster design, but a lot of what mechanical engineers do is manufacturing processes. A lot of different fields, but again, today we'll focus on civil. And all, you know, it kind of seems maybe like the least glamorous of all, but um, I actually think that civil is really cool. And towards the end, I'm going to show you some really awesome videos of some things that we do in civil engineering. So maybe to sway you a little bit towards, uh, towards my side. So, okay, so then what I'd like to do now is uh, if we're talking about civil engineering, what does that mean? Okay, so yes. So civil, you mean, so she said, I hear people and like civilization. So that's actually, that's really good. Okay, so we do a lot of like city planning. So anybody who plans a city is going to be a civil engineer. What other things do civil engineers do? I think it's like the one that's the most abstract. Nobody really knows what a civil engineer does. Yeah. Infrastructure. Oh, I like that word. What does infrastructure mean? Buildings and bridges, roadways. Roadways are considered infrastructure, so being able to drive from here to San Francisco on I-80, um, that's part of our infrastructure. Good. What else? Any other things that civil engineers do? You guys can think of? Yes. Ooh, earthquake protection. I am so glad that you talked about that because those are the cool videos I'm going to show you guys later. They absolutely help with earthquake protection. My background is in earthquake protection, so um, we have a really cool lab here on campus where we have big shake tables. Has anybody been to the shake table lab on like a field trip? Okay, so some of you guys have. Uh, I used to work in the shake table lab. There's a very big possibility if you were here two years ago, I gave you your tour of the shake table lab. Um, so I worked for the lab for about seven years, but we do a lot of earthquake protection in buildings. Any building that you see that's constructed, all civil engineers. So we've got a building that we just built right across the way here, the new fitness center. Civil engineer had to design all the plans for that. So they had to come up with like, okay, what size is this beam? What size is this column? How do we connect all this stuff together, you know? So our buildings are a major thing for civils. Um, and then you said earthquake protection. So I want to point this picture out. This is in New Zealand um, about five years ago when they had a series of earthquakes down in Christchurch. So um, this is not what we want, right? This is definitely not what you want to see um, after an earthquake. So in high seismic areas, we have to make sure that these buildings aren't going to do this. The bridges is a big thing. I actually worked as a bridge designer at NDOT for about a year after I graduated. Um, so any sort of bridge structure, civil engineers are going to design. So do you guys know what bridge this is? Golden Gate Bridge. This isn't coming out so well on this projector, but this is a picture of what happens to bridges when there's earthquakes and we're not prepared for them. This is in 1994 in Los Angeles, and what this is in the middle here is this is a bridge column, and this is a bridge, so the bridge used to be here, right, and now the bridge is down here. These people are standing on this bridge. Before these earthquakes, civil engineers didn't know how to design bridges properly, like we thought we knew, um, and then we were like, oops, we were wrong. So uh, that's why we have the shake table lab, which again, I'll talk about a little bit later, but um, this is what happens when things aren't designed properly. And so when you talked about civilization, you talked about infrastructure. So this is a really big infrastructure one. This is uh, what it looks like in some big cities like Los Angeles. You know, they've got all these crazy freeway systems. Not only do we design these types of systems, but we also try and manage and mitigate traffic. You know, nobody wants to sit in traffic. So we, we also um, do stuff that has to do with traffic. Now, how would you solve a problem like this? If this was, you know, your job, what would you do about this? What, what would you do? Add more lanes. Well, it looks like there's a lot of lanes already, right? And at some point, like, you can't really take this guy's house down, right? So I think they've kind of maxed out their lane capacity. What do you think? Um, create, an route. create an alternate route. Yeah, that's, that's also definitely an option. Although the people that, like, live farther over here that spent $1 million on their Malibu home may not want you to go through their front yard, right? So you could create an alternate route. Yeah, what else? Stacking. Stacking. So maybe, so maybe if like one 
you know, direction of the lanes was all of this, and then the other direction was like a big bridge on top of it, right? That was all going the other direction. Going up is definitely going to be something I think we're going to see in our future. This is a this is a geo wall, so this is actually um, a retaining wall. So when you cut into the side of a, you know a, the earth or something to build a freeway or a roadway, you have to add a wall and you actually have to tie it back so that all of this doesn't come down and and you have a landslide. So. This is what happens when you could have like a huge mudslide. And sometimes when you have large landslides and mudslides, they can actually you know, trigger tsunamis, surprisingly enough. Uh, you can, like if that happens in the ocean or somewhere like near a big body of water, you can actually trigger a tsunami, which is even, a, you know, then you have another problem to deal with, so. Okay, and then this is a foundation. So the one thing that I think a lot of people forget is that there is something below us, right? So before they built this building, like they didn't want to build it on sand, you know, they didn't want to build it on clay. So you have to have someone come in and analyze what's underneath your structure before you build it. Because if you don't do that, you can have some serious problems um, with the structure itself. So this is the foundation of a new building that's going to go in. Uh, this is what happens when you don't do your homework. And uh, so you see like all of these buildings are in place, right? Uh, what's wrong with this building? Yeah, it's it's intact, right? The building stood up, so that engineer has got a good, you know, did a good job. But the problem is the foundation was not good. So this thing was built on um, a soil that liquefied during an earthquake. So what happens when your soil is not compacted well enough? Um, it actually liquefies during an earthquake, and it just sinks in like quicksand, and then it just like tips over. <laughs> So um, this is a, what a water treatment plant looks like. They they bring in all the raw sewage. They they screen out all the particulate matter, all the large particles, right? You can use your imagination, I suppose. Um, and then what it has to go through is a series of cleaning steps where they get out all the smaller particles, all the chemicals. You know, the second that you pour some chemicals down your, your drain or, you know, even dish soap. So you're washing dish soap down your drain. You put stuff down your garbage disposal and you turn it on and you wash all those particles down. Um, so this is a water treatment plant. We have to clean the water that comes to your tap. We are a very fortunate situation that we don't live in a place like this where this is just raw sewage running down through their rivers. Um, and this is where they sometimes get their drinking water. And that is not a good thing. You don't want to drink raw sewage. If you didn't already know that, obviously you don't want to drink raw sewage, right, as you're drinking water. So uh, we can help people by being able to clean their water. So has anybody heard of 3D printing? Has anybody used a 3D printer before? Um, so this is a video about how this guy invented a 3D printer for steel in order to build bridges. Super cool. So let's watch this for a second. At first, they were little worm-like blobs. It was hard to see, but we saw a universe of possibilities. Of course, many things went wrong. A welding machine exploded, nozzles got stuck, and the robot got disoriented. But then, they became long lines, complex curves, and double curved oval tubes. It was like drawing in midair. And after endless testing, we were able to speed up the process and produce this complex sculpture of lines. And now, we are ready for the ultimate poster project, to test all facets of this highly promising printing technology. A large-scale object that is functional and meaningful. We are going to print the steel bridge in Amsterdam. We have so many tools available to us, so many computer tools and really awesome things available that like engineers are going to start printing bridges. I mean, isn't that crazy? They can make these giant printers and print bridges. So um, definitely very promising for the future, very promising career um, to take a look at. So.
So I kind of want to transition, now that you guys know what civil engineers do, I want to talk a little bit about what you would do to be an engineer in college. Um, and I can tell you guys a little bit about how I got to where I am and you know what I did. So I teach here at UNR. I actually got a bachelor's degree back in 2006 in civil engineering, and then I went on and did a master's degree, so that's like your next two-year degree. I don't know really even how I chose engineering. Like I wasn't fortunate to know what an engineer even did until about my sophomore year of college, and I was kind of like, not really sure what I wanted to do and I was like I don't know building roads is kind of cool and so then I ended up uh, just picking engineering and it ended up working out really well for me I just I really liked it and there's a lot of really cool stuff that I got to do here at UNR that I think kind of made me go in the path that I have you know chosen now so I'm definitely not a traditional engineer I went and worked for about a year in the field designing bridges and it wasn't really for me um, I didn't I didn't love sitting and like designing I, and a ton of people do a lot ton of people like to sit and design um, I have friends that don't like that and they actually go into construction even a lot of women go into construction and they actually are construction engineers and they are out on the job site every day helping build stuff which is pretty cool one thing that you guys can do if you decide to choose engineering or even if you decide to choose anything else at UNR they have a lot of these Nevada fit boot camps and I believe that fit stands for freshman and do you remember it's like I can't remember what the intensive. intensive that's what the I is I was like I know it's not freshman in training but it's freshman intensive training and uh, almost every major has these boot camps that you can do so it's optional but it's the week before school starts and we do one for engineering too and you come and you like move into the dorms a week early and you actually you go to class but you know you're gonna be going to class for the next four years so you know, you just suck it up. But you go to class, you go to, you know, some physics classes and some, some math classes and the students actually like get to know campus and, and they get to meet people and you design trebuchets. So they like on the last day, the students all go out onto the, the main quad and they like try and, you know, hit things with a trebuchet and stuff, which is pretty cool. So that's one opportunity that you have like going into the program is doing these boot camps um, before. And I think that the research shows that students that do the boot camps actually do much better um, their freshman and sophomore years in their classes. Um, so I don't know exactly why that is or if it's just because you know people that are going to do better pick I don't know but uh, the introductory class in engineering that's the one I was talking about that has all the freshman students uh, the, the students get into teams and they build a hovercraft and that's your term project so you do have to come to lecture and you learn how to use programs like Excel and SolidWorks but we teach you how to do a wiring diagram and you actually have to wire your whole hovercraft together and you have to figure out how to it's autonomous so you at the end of the semester you push the go button and it has to go down I think uh, 16 feet and it has to somehow come back but you don't control it so you have to figure out how to write the program to make it go down and, and come back all on its own which is kind of cool and we, we teach you guys how to do that so um, that would be like your first semester at UNR you would take that with me because that's uh, I'm the, the teacher that does that along with a couple other instructors um, you do have to take a lot of math and physics um, so those are kind of like your first two years you're sort of you know covered in math and physics and you have to take your basic chemistry and you know English and stuff like that and it's just those are just general requirements that you have to get out of the way um, of course in engineering you do have to be relatively good at math um, you know it's definitely not something that's you know you just come up with something and you don't do any math on it right you have to do calculations and then finally you get to your fundamental engineering courses and those are the courses that I teach like I teach students how to calculate stress and strain and how to like tell me how much this beam is bending when I put a load on it and it's and all the basic things that you need to know to move forward as an engineer and then finally like your junior senior year you actually get into oh so sorry the statics mechanics and materials and dynamics which is what I teach and then uh, you get specific classes about your major so that's like your junior senior year so if you're a civil engineer you do things like concrete design like how to actually design a concrete beam and uh, steel design how to actually like you know put steel pieces together or timber design how to build like a house out of wood you know so that's sort of the progression as you go through college of how the program will go if you decide to pick engineering so the other thing that is obviously not curriculum oriented is the clubs and volunteer activities and that's something that really influenced me as a student here and uh, I joined a club as the American Society of Civil Engineers and that was in 2004 and I am still a part of that club today so it's not just like a student club it's actually a professional society but I actually still act as the advisor for this club that I joined and so like I went through I was a student I did their competitions and then when I came back to UNR I was like hey I want to want to like help you guys I want to be your advisor so um, I get to help the students with their competition teams which I'll show you guys a couple videos in a second of what they do so American Society of Civil Engineers so this is the club I was a part of it's the society I'm part of now 
and they, they do social activities, so we have like pizza nights and stuff like that, bowling nights, um, volunteer opportunities. So like I think uh, last December we adopted a family um, in the, uh, you know, for the Christmas months and we bought the, like, we got the whole list of their, their um, Christmas lists and we, we bought stuff for them and tried to like, you know, get them like a nice Christmas, which was really nice. So we do some volunteer stuff um, and connections to internships. Like if you want a job, you should join a club or a society. Uh, I know, so every student that I know through ASC, like I always have my other contacts that work in the community, they're asking me like as a professional, hey, like who should I hire? You know, and today there was a career fair and I sent a bunch of students up there and I said, hey, well, like could go talk to this person and, you know, drop my name. And so my friend Kristen, who was working, she texts me and is like, oh, I met this girl, Emily. She told me that, you know, you worked with her. And so that is definitely a good way to get a job and internship when you're in college. And finally, the most fun part, which is why I left it for last, is our competition teams. So has anybody heard of the Concrete Canoe competition? Yeah, okay, a couple of you are nodding, so that's super awesome, you guys have heard of that. So I will show you guys a video in a second, but we've got three competition teams that our undergraduates participate in, and we go to a conference every uh, spring. So this April, it's in Chico, California, is our regional conference, and if we make it in like the top one or two teams of our respective competitions, we go to a national conference. And uh, Steel Bridge, we were really good at back in the 90s. I think we won the national competition in like 1999, but that was a really long time ago. I wasn't here. The students basically build, um, they have to build a 20 foot long bridge-ish, um, and they have to make the pieces, each individual piece of the bridge is less than three and a half feet, so like about this big. So they actually take each piece of the bridge and they put it into a little box to make sure it you know, fits the dimensions. And then at the competition, you have to build it in front of the judges. So it's an efficiency, you know, they're measuring your efficiency, like how quickly can you build it? You know, if you drop a bolt in the water that you're going over, because you like drop the lines, you drop a bolt, then you get points off, and you know, the fewer people that you use to actually construct it, you get more points and stuff. So this is a video, this next video is about the Steel Bridge competition. And this was taken uh, this past year, so last May, at the national competition. So we didn't make it there, but this is from the, the national competition. So those are the bridges when they're fully constructed. 220 some schools that entered conference or regional competitions this year. You figure at each school, there's probably an average of 10 students involved. So we're impacting every year about 2,000 civil engineering students, getting their hands on steel, getting them to design something that they actually have to build. So we end up with these students who are proficient in basic steel design. Uh, my favorite part of working with steel structures is how much versatility there is in the design process. Steel allows you to design very stiff structures, or we can trade that off to design structures that we can build at a very, uh, very fast pace. As far as working with steel, this is a fantastic hands-on project that uh, helps me be able to apply what I learned in the classroom to a real-life scenario, and I can take that to further help me out in, in my career path. So that's Steel Bridge. We haven't made it to nationals since 1999. I've never seen it, but uh, it's really competitive, and we've got a team this year, and um, they're building their bridge right now for our regional competition, so we see how they do, but that is one of the competitions that we do. Um, the other one is Concrete Canoe, which is why I asked you guys because we, um, I think more people have probably heard of the Concrete Canoe team. So um, I was actually here when we formed our Concrete Canoe team in 2005. Then in 2006, I was on the team, I was a paddler, so in the Concrete Canoe team, you have to, you have to paddle your canoe around in five different races. You have to paddle against other teams, and this thing, it is made out of concrete, okay? But uh, yeah, so they paddle these things around. I was a paddler, we were so bad. We were so bad at paddling. Um, the concrete, the canoe was like breaking into pieces, and uh, like th this water was like coming in uh, through the cracks. So um, we made it to the national competition. That was the first time our school ever made it to the national competition in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Never forget that trip. So we went and we got sixth place overall in the national competition. There were about 21 teams there, but overall there's about 280 teams throughout the, the nation that compete in this. So like sixth place, that's pretty awesome, right? Um, and so ever since then, we have placed in the top five, except for one year in 20, 2015. Every other year since 2006, we've placed in the top five um, in the national competition. 
Um, I'm playing this video, which is a little old. It's from 2012, but we hosted the national competition in 2012. So um, the, the people that work at UNR got some really good footage. So I like this video because also it shows our team. So these girls um, in this green boat, that's our team. I actually know these girls really well. Um, both civil engineers. So all these people are civil engineers. We're hosting the National Concrete Canoe Competition this year, and we're really proud to be hosting. This is my third year competing at the competition, and all the teams come out here. We have 22 teams from across the nation, and every team is super competitive. The competition gives us real-world, hands-on experience outside of the classroom. It really gives you insight to the critical thinking that you'll need being an engineer, because nobody's going to give you the answer. You have to find them all. On Thursday is display day, so everybody's out there with their canoes and displays, and you get to see everybody's hard work uh, laid out in their best fashion. Around 200 schools compete in the concrete canoe competition, and only a small percentage make it to nationals. We put in countless hours. We have about 5,500 man hours this year. So we make our canoe out of lightweight concrete, so it's not regular sidewalk concrete. We put things like lightweight aggregates, such as glass bubbles, it's not just sand and rocks like normal concrete is. Everybody puts their heart into their canoes and tries to make it to nationals and do their best. It gives you insight to the countless hours that you have to put into work being an engineer. Everybody's out here cheering on their teams, cheering on other teams just because you love the camaraderie of the competition. We definitely have a well-rounded team in all the different categories and so hopefully we can make top five. We're hoping that our engineering holds up in the canoe and we don't have any deductions. We've been working so hard out here uh, every day, so we really want to excel in our races and have it all pay off. Um, I said there were three competition teams, so those are two of them. The third one I don't have a video of because it's not a national competition, but we do have a water treatment competition. So you remember I told you that civil engineers also treat your drinking water. So this one is kind of cool because they give you like a recipe, like they give you a scenario and a recipe for water. So one year it was like you had a Mexican fiesta at your house, you had like a taco party or something, and you took all of the, the stuff and you put it down the drain and it like clogged up your drain. So it was like, they had like tortilla chips and salsa and like cheese and like all this nasty stuff that they just like mix into the water. And then what the team has to do is they buy household items from Home Depot. And then during the competition, they actually cut a piece, you know, cut apart all the wood and they hammer the whole thing together and they use like, you know, like little plastic bins and, and stuff like that. And they filter the water in front of the judges. And so then you collect a sample of water and then they test it for like the clarity and the pH and like, you know, like uh, how much of this stuff is left in there. So there's all sorts of parameters that they, that they um, judge it on. But we don't, we don't have a national competition. That one's just in our, within our region. But um, people find that one really fun. So I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a video for that one. But uh, all of this, you know, everything that I've shown you, especially with these competitions, is about working in teams, right? So as an engineer, there is just no way that you can get around working in teams. So like in that freshman engineering class, we're going to stick you in a team of people and you're going to have to make a hovercraft with them. So I'm going to ask just a couple questions here. So why is working in teams important? What do you guys think? Yeah, I'll go in back. So you want to bounce ideas off of each other. So it's not just your ideas. You actually want other people's ideas. Really good. Absolutely. You're not stuck doing everything, yeah? You have, a, it's divided up, right? You each have like your own piece of the pie so that you're not doing all the work. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in big engineering projects, we absolutely, like not one person can build a building, right? So everybody needs a piece in it. What do you think? Work done more efficiently. Yeah, I think that's kind of what you were trying to say. But yeah, so work, work done more efficiently. What else? Nobody knows everything. Very good, absolutely. No, but so like, it's not like one civil engineer put this building together, right? You had your electrical engineer, you had your, um, your mechanical engineer put in all these air ducts and, and vents and stuff, so not every person can do everything. Yeah, nobody knows everything. Um, you, catch potential problems you catch potential problems easier. Yeah, when you have a second set of eyes, 
it is much easier to catch problems. And so I teach, like, my, uh, my mechanics class this semester is 210 kids. Not kids, you're not kids. Uh, 210 students. And so when I do math in front of them, oh, man, that is nerve-wracking because everybody is looking for your errors, and they always find them, and I'm like, oh, man, like, I can't do it right. Uh, but it's always good to have a second set of eyes looking at your, your errors that you might have. So good, okay, so, um, so what would help you work in teams? What would help you work in a team better? Or do you think you could just work in teams with everybody and it's fine? Make sure you're open to everyone else's ideas. Make sure you're open to everyone else's ideas, yes. It's really hard to work in a team when somebody insists that all their ideas are the only ideas that matter, right? That's not really gonna be helpful, what else? Don't put your opinions too much into it. Don't put your opinions too much into it, maybe just focus on the task at hand rather than like your opinions or something that matters to you more, okay, what else? Compromise. Compromise. A blend of everybody's ideas. Yeah, that's a big one that we get from our Engineering 100 teams is that like sometimes there's just one kid that's like, I know everything about hovercrafts and it's like, okay, like let everybody else participate for a second. Yeah, so it's, it's hard sometimes to like get everybody's ideas in there. What else? Make sure the work is well divided between people. Also well defined, right? So if you don't know exactly what your work is, um, then it's also hard to do it all. Okay, so this is leading into something. This is leading into a team building activity that I'm going to have you guys all do. And let's see, it looks like you guys are gonna have three tasks, okay? So what we have here is you're going to start, first off, your first task is start with the cups upside down, and then you're in, oh, they're gonna be all in a row, and you guys are gonna have to stack them into a pyramid that looks like this. So you guys will get six cups, and you have to together stack them into a pyramid. Now once you finish that, your second task is gonna be starting with the cups right side up. Okay, you have to flip them upside down and stack them into the same pyramid. And then the final task, if we get to that, is start with the cups on their side and then flip them upside down and stack them into the pyramid. So there's three different tasks that you guys are gonna to have to work together on in order to accomplish this. some questions about what you guys just accomplished. So we're going to talk about working in teams, right? So you guys told me some good reasons to work in teams. You also told me some things that would make it easier to work in teams. But now that you just did this, let's kind of uh, debrief a little bit. So what did you learn about yourself or maybe other people? Or maybe I could just put these up here and we could just talk about multiple uh, bullet points. So we, I think we know why teamwork was so important. But what was so hard, like, did you find anything hard about working in teams? Do you guys know these people? Like, have you guys actually all met before, like everybody who's in the team together? Not necessarily. Some of you had. So did you find it difficult if you didn't know the people in your team? Maybe if you're a little shy or something, you don't really know how to like talk to somebody or tell them what to do if you had an idea? No, you were, you were good with that? <laughs> okay. Anybody else find anything that was difficult about this besides the actual act of like, you know, turning over the, what do you think? So if one person's messed up, you know, then your whole team had to suffer, right? So, and you don't want to like necessarily blame anybody, especially if you just met them. You don't, you know, you're gonna have to see them several more times. So, um, let's see. So this is the main one. So what are some skills that you guys needed to actually be good at this teamwork? What made it easier if you had certain skills in order to be good at this team activity? Communicating, Communicating. absolutely. Anything else? What else? Leadership and the idea that uh, leadership isn't just being the leader, but also knowing 
oh, I really like that. He said leadership. And so leadership is not always about being the leader, but sometimes knowing when not to be the leader and actually following other people. So did anybody have kind of like a, like somebody who was almost a team leader that would like call out all of the, the commands? Like, or were you guys all just sort of working together with like, okay. So you did have somebody on your team that was like sort of telling everybody how to work and what to do? Kind of, okay. All right, any other skills that you guys think were important in this activity that, that made it difficult or that you need to do? I think communication is really the most important one. Yeah. Making sure you the instructions. Ooh, making sure you understood the instructions. That's absolutely really important in teamwork because you guys, if you un don't understand the instructions, um, and then you could just go off and do something that's completely not what I was asking for. Very good. So now I'm going to completely shift gears. So if you guys do have questions, feel free to stop me. But I'm going to shift gears as I've been promising all evening that I was going to talk a little bit more about um, my time in the Earthquake Engineering Research Lab. So the whole idea behind this is I'm going to show you guys some pretty cool videos of things breaking, so everybody likes to see that for the most part. Um, so I worked for seven years for the Center for Civil Engineering Earthquake Research. We call it CSEER, and it's here on campus, and it's the big earthquake lab that a few of you said that you had been to. Um, this is what the lab looks like. So uh, this is down in the south end of campus, so it's about a seven-minute walk from here. I actually work in this building every day. There's a teaching lab downstairs, and so I do um, a lot of my teaching for one of my classes down in there. And uh, right here in these big roll-up doors is where we have our shake tables. Uh, we have two buildings, so over here on the left-hand side where those, that roll-up door is, we used to have all of our shake tables over there. And then in 2014, 2014 I think, we, uh, we opened this new building and we actually switched all of our shake tables over into the new lab. It's a huge space. Um, so these are what the shake tables look like when they're not, when they don't have anything on them. Um, these things are um, about 12 feet by 12 feet, so they're pretty big. And these things are called hydraulic actuators, and this is how we power the shake table. So these things are massive, and they're very powerful. We can, um, we can hold about 100,000 pounds on these shake tables, and we can still make the acceleration on these tables equal to what it would be like if you fell out of the sky. So acceleration due to gravity, we can move these tables that quickly. Um, with 100,000 pounds on them each. Um, so they're pretty, they're pretty cool, they're pretty unique too. So you see that here they're in a, a straight line. We keep our shake tables in a straight line. We can actually build bridges that span across multiple shake tables. So we have four of them total. Um, this is what the other one looks like. But uh, we can use all four of them either alone, like by themselves, or we can use them together. So we have the, uh, the opportunity to build large bridges and large structures that span all of these shake tables. Now, why do you think, why, why do we want to use shake tables? Like, just because we like to spend money or, I mean, that's always fun, but do you have any ideas of like why we would want to use these? What do you think? Oh, good. Did you learn that when you visited the shake table lab? Because that's exactly usually what I say. So she said, so you don't have to wait for the earthquake to come to learn about it. What else? So you can accurately simulate an earthquake. Yeah, what else? So you can do it in a safe environment where it won't harm other people, yes. It'll be a lot cheaper than a whole building falling down, I promise you that. Um, and a lot less devastating, you know, you're not going to injure any people doing this. So those are all very great reasons for us to have a big earthquake lab. We didn't have research facilities like this even in the 1980s. This facility only came in the 1990s, so this is a very new type of research. And you remember I showed you that bridge at the beginning that was falling down, right? And there was like those people that were out walking on it and that happened in 1994 in LA. Well, before then, they didn't have shake tables. And we were like, yeah, maybe that was a really bad idea not to test this idea before we built it. So earthquakes sometimes can take up to 100 years to come around for a really strong earthquake. And so if we have to wait 100 years every time that we want to test an idea, it's probably not very good. Um, so that's why this, this lab is around. This is what it looks like inside the new lab. So you can see these are the one, two, three shake tables. And this is shake table number four over here. There's actually some stuff on these tables. This is a little building and, and some different things on the table. So um, it's in this giant like warehousey type building that we have a lot of space and a lot of height. So this is about uh, 35 feet that we have tall in order to build some tall structures. So I've got three different projects that I want to show you videos of just because these are really cool things. So the first one is uh, this curved bridge project. So this bridge itself is 145 feet long. It is curved 
as you can see, so like if you're getting on I-80, right, or like the Spaghetti Bowl, I-80, 395, you're going around and around, right? That's actually a bridge structure, and it's a curved bridge structure. It's highly curved. And what we were looking at in this test is how do cars impact how bridges behave in earthquakes? Because the seismic design standards that engineers follow don't necessarily consider those two load scenarios at the same time. They say, well, the, the probability is relatively low, so the chance of the bridge being fully loaded with cars is probably pretty unlikely to happen with an earthquake. But I don't know if I believe that in a place like San Francisco or Los Angeles anymore. I don't think that that may be true. So we wanted to investigate what happens when we put six Ford F-250 trucks rented from Enterprise um, onto our bridge. <laughs> a pretty big earthquake. This is the 1994 Northridge earthquake that brought down that bridge I showed you earlier. Now I'm sitting right about here. I have a brown hard hat on. It's hard to see me. It is. That was scary. Those things are like 30 feet in the air and they're moving around quite a bit and uh, I think that if you were on a bridge during an earthquake you'd probably be pretty, pretty frightened about it. All right so one thing I want to direct your attention to is that during certain conditions during earthquakes Bridges may or may not be restrained at the very end. So this is the condition where this guy was actually free to slide. You'll be able to see this. I'm going to play it again. You'll be able to see this piece. And what it does is it actually lifts up and it slams back down. And it was a little bit frightening when we were next to it. So I want you to watch it lift. It actually lifts two different times. And uh, it was a very interesting thing to observe in a laboratory that that's what happens at the end of a bridge during an earthquake. It goes once and right here. The whole thing lifted up off of the, uh, the surface and then slammed back down. So um, we had to do a lot of design on this guy to make sure that what was going to happen is it wasn't going to slam back down onto the people. And of course, even if it did, it can't it landed on these safety frames. But um, this is a really cool experiment. Now, from this angle, it doesn't necessarily look like there was much damage, right? Now, I'm going to play another video for you. And this is a close-up video of one of the concrete columns during the same earthquake. All right, so this concrete column is, um, so you can see the bridge now up here. This, this video was taken with a GoPro camera. And so this is one of the concrete columns during the earthquakes. Now with our earthquakes, we don't run the maximum earthquake the first time because that would probably be unsafe. So you see that there's already cracks in the column. Um, and so we just keep running higher and higher percentages until we actually see something that's um, devastating. So um, it's not gonna fall down, but uh, you will see what happens here. Looks like there was a little bit more damage, right? Than maybe it looked like from the first glance. So this whole thing was lifting up apart and then all this concrete crumbled off over here. So if this was in the field, you would not be able to drive on this bridge ever again. This is, this is something that is, is done, done for. So this next test was on non-structural components. So non-structural components are anything in a building that are not physically holding it up, okay? So this column that you see over here, I don't know if there's any columns here. These columns here, these columns here, this is holding the building up, okay? All of this stuff is not holding it up, but also very, very important to the functionality of this building, right? Um, this looks like it might be a, oh, this is the roof drain. We don't want that to break. Uh, we've got all the electrical components, all these water components. You've got your um, AC and your heater over there. All things that we call non-structural components. They're not structurally holding the, the structure up, but they're very important to functionality, okay? So non-structural components, we did a test on all of these different components and we set up a room in the shake table. So this is a three-story building. You can see ceiling tiles coming down. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a big earthquake. So uh, that was a test that we were actually, we had water lines run through that structure and they were pressurized during the test and we were testing all the connections. These, all these little connections are really important because where the connections are is where you're gonna have something fractured and fell during an earthquake and then 
your whole building is going to be destroyed. About 80% uh, of the building's cost is in, in contents and non-structural components. So if you destroy everything inside, even if the building's still standing, you cannot operate your business the next day. It's really important for hospitals. You know, you don't want to go to a hospital where they don't have running water. So these are, that's why um, we do you know, tests like that. Um, this building uh, is made of steel, and then we had a drywaller come in and actually put in all the drywall and stuff. I thought it might show a picture of it. But um, some of the pieces we build ourselves, but some of them we actually have a contractor come in, a professional come in and, and build them. So it depends. All right, I've got one more bridge for you. And this guy is made, not this guy, uh, this is a professor. I mean, so this bridge that I'm going to show you is made with these special elastic columns. And it's made so that after an earthquake, it's going to go through a lot of deformation and a lot of damage. And what happened is after this big earthquake, you're going to see it basically went back to where it started, which is not something we generally see in bridges. And it's really important for getting emergency vehicles across and people to get home after a big earthquake. So um, you can see, it'll show some really close-up pictures of how much this is deforming in that direction due to this earthquake. Look at how much that's moving. This bridge is 110 feet long. It's spanning across three of our shake tables. I think that there's a really good close-up picture that shows how much these guys are going left to right. Um, maybe we already passed it, but to think that something could go through an earthquake that big and still be back in its original condition. Like, look, there's no fracture. This doesn't look anything like that curved bridge, right? It doesn't have any cracks in it. Concrete's not really falling off. And that was the same basic earthquake as the other bridge. There's a little bit, okay? There's a little bit of damage right there. But these are the types of things that we can do in our industry is we can try and design things and make them so that after an earthquake, you don't have to repair anything, you know, and, and you can get everybody home at the end of the day, even if there's trucks on top of your bridge. So that one was kind of a cool project. Okay. So I have one more activity for you guys to do. But first I'd like to ask you if you have any questions about earthquakes or anything that I've done in the lab. Have we ever tried testing them on houses? Yeah, we don't usually do a lot of house stuff on our shake tables because it is really expensive to run these. And for the most part, standard timber construction like what you guys live in, there's a generally pretty safe in earthquakes. Um, now masonry on the other hand, like if, uh, in, if you go to Florida or the East Coast or something, they build all of their stuff out of bricks. Not good for, for um, earthquakes. You won't see anything built out of bricks over here. Now you might think like these buildings here all look like they're built out of bricks, but they're actually built out of steel and they have brick faces on the outside. So we don't do a ton of timber stuff on our shake tables. Yeah. What's the coolest project I've got to work on? That curved bridge. I was actually in charge of like, you remember how, so I told you, I showed you the picture of the building on the right and the picture, the picture of the building on the left. The building on the right had two large doors on it. The building on the left had one door and it had a ramp that goes like this. So like the door was here and the ramp goes like this. Well, I had to get three pieces of curved bridge inside that door um, off of the bed of a truck. It was very complicated. You know, geometry was like probably my biggest enemy, which is kind of funny to think as an engineer. Like my biggest competitor was geometry that day, but like getting these, these big curved pieces of steel girder concrete bridges in, in, that was very complex. But that was a cool project to work on. Very cool. Okay, so I want to give you guys some more time. So I'm going to have you guys get in groups of two. And uh, your team only has one task this time. And Chanel is going to come around with some, uh, some ingredients for you. And what you guys are going to do is build the tallest tower that you can from spaghetti and marshmallows. Okay, we're going to give you spaghetti. You can break the spaghetti into smallest pieces as you want. You can use as many marshmallows as you want. But you are going to have a time on this one, right? So you wanted a competition. All right, so we are going to have a time limit. You guys are going to have until 7.15 to build the tallest tower that you can out of only spaghetti and marshmallows. You're gonna to have to find a teammate and you can get up, go get your materials and the tallest tower by 715 is gonna be the winner.
All right, what are we at here? Was that three feet? Three feet, three and a half inches. All right, so let's take a look over here. Okay, and this one is three feet, one and a half inches. So you guys are like two inches short. So our winner is our lone wolf back here. Awesome, good job. <laughs> Okay, so let's just talk about this really quickly. So what made this hard? What made this task hard? What do you think? So if the spaghetti didn't break at the exact right length, it made it hard. What else made it hard? The marshmallows were like too fresh, right? So I didn't open the marshmallows last week and let them set out. But if I had, then it probably would have been better for building, but not as good for eating. So yeah, the marshmallows were a little fresh. Okay, did anybody make a plan before starting? <laughs> a couple of you did. So you guys made a plan before starting? You made a plan before starting? You made a plan for your base, but everything kind of fell apart because the spaghetti sticks weren't all the same length. Okay. So a lot of times, if you spend a little bit of time planning, and less time constructing, you can generally make a little bit of a better product. So if anybody was to do this again, would you start maybe by making a better plan? Or you probably have a better plan in your mind, right? What was one thing that you noticed was really important as far as the shapes go? Triangles. Triangles, right? So anytime that you're building something, especially for seismic design, you always want triangles. Triangles are going to be your friend. For my friends here that had, um, there were two groups, you guys were having a little bit of trouble with your, uh, your structures were just kind of like folding over right into these really funky shapes so um, when we added bracing and triangles that made it a little bit better <clears throat> so if you did do it again what would you do differently uh, larger, base. larger base you would do a larger base any other things you would do differently if you did this again more triangles, more triangles. <laughs> what else so you want us you want us to set your marshmallows out and get them stale first Lots of marshmallows in every piece. So yeah, this team actually used pretty much two marshmallows almost at every intersection, it looks like. Yeah, so lots of marshmallows in every piece. Anything else you guys would do differently? Yeah, you're going to go raid your family's stash of spaghetti and start making towers of it at home. And they'll be like, where did you learn this? OK, well, with that, that is actually my whole presentation. This is our concrete canoe from 2014. This one won first place at the national competition. I'm, I'm here somewhere in the front. Is that me? That's me. Um, so this was us in uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I think that's the year. This is Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Kind of a cool concrete canoe. It doesn't really look like concrete. Um, so just something to leave you with. But with that, I have time for questions. If you guys have questions about me, how I got here, what I do with my career, what I do every day, engineering, I don't know, marshmallows. I can try to attempt to answer those. Yeah. What do I do on a daily basis? Okay, so my schedule, like, so as a, an instructor and a teacher, I have sort of a different schedule than any other engineer that you would that you would imagine. But I teach four days a week. I teach Monday through Thursday. Um, so, for example, my schedule today, I taught uh, from eight to eleven. I have so my my one of my classes is broken into four days a week. So on Mondays and Wednesdays, we do a one-hour lecture with two hundred kids students. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they're broken down further into eight different discussion groups that are hour long. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I teach three of those discussion groups. So I've got about 32 students in there, and they're broken into groups, and they do problems on whiteboards. Um, so from 8 to 11 today, I taught. Um, and then I had a two-hour break. So with my first hour of my one-hour break, I helped the ASCE Concrete Canoe team actually fill out all their travel paperwork to go to their competition, made sure that their registration is going to get paid. So not a glamorous part of my job, but something that needs to get done so that they can get all of their stuff ready. Then I was able to eat my lunch as I started doing the uh, problems that we were going to do in the afternoon in my other class. So from then from 1 to 2.15, I went to class and taught one section of dynamics. 2.30 to 3.45, I taught another section of dynamics. I came up here and met at Starbucks with a friend because he was at the career fair today. And then I came here and now this, this is it. So pretty much my days are very full. I usually work from about 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, during the school year. But the cool thing for me is that I have between about May 10th and August 28th off. So I work lots of hours during the semester, but then I have teacher schedule, right? So that's pretty cool for me. So pretty much my days are like teaching, ASCE, more teaching, and finally going home and answering emails, because I haven't answered any of my emails today. I have lots to do when I get home. Other questions that you guys have for me? Yes? What's your favorite part about being an engineer or teaching 
what's my favorite part about being an engineer or teaching? So when I was doing the research stuff, I thought it was really cool when we finally got to finish a project. When you see something finished that you design and you're like, wow, I did that, or I was a part of that, that's really cool. That's a really cool part of the project. Or um, I think as a teacher, one of my favorite things is like when I get to do stuff like this and you know, if I see one of you guys in one of my classes two years from now, that would be awesome. Or when a student comes back to me and says that they like learned a lot in my class, you know, I think that for me, my favorite part is knowing that I am helping students and helping other people and hopefully helping you towards a career that's going to make you happy. So that's what I get a lot of joy out of uh, as a teacher. So. Oh, we are out of time. I'd like to thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight and telling us so much about you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you guys so much for coming.